uh, welcome to this uh, virtual field day. We were obviously going to have it in person out in western Minnesota, but due to COVID, uh, this is just another way our lives has, have been upended by that. Um, so as we start, just like to thank our sponsor, Gemplers. Um, since 1939, folks who work outdoors have been gearing up with Gemplers, family owned, fiercely independent. Gemplers is your online outdoor general store for commercial grade tools, clothing and supplies, plus other outdoor gear. Use promo code MOSES15, and that's all caps, the MOSES, to save 15% on your next order through the end of July. Uh, some exclusions apply. Go see offer details at gemplers.com. So that code again is MOSES15 in all caps for 15% off. Uh, and this partnership is, uh, this field day was produced in partnership with the Forever Green Initiative at University of Minnesota, the Land Institute, uh, and O'Grain at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, other resources for Moses include our Organic Farming Conference, which will be uh, online this year. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, it's obviously going to be different, but I think we're going we're gonna to make it great. And then other field days like this, and um, the virtual ones will all be available on, online on YouTube afterwards as well. Um, and then along with this field day, there were seven YouTube videos made with um, various people who are working on, on developing Kearns as a viable crop uh, production-wise and economically uh, in the Midwest. Um, and so you can check those out on the Moses YouTube channel. If you just search Moses Organic, it, it should come up. Um, and these are some other, other resources we have here as well. Um, uh, for Zoom for Zoom tips, um, make sure your name is on there, uh, and then if you want to drop in the chat where you're where you're at, um, that'll give folks a little context for for who you are um, and help answer your questions. Um, use the chat function as we go to ask questions. Uh, there should be a menu on the bottom of your screen to ask questions, and then um, everyone except the presenters and the moderator. We'll stay muted until we start the Q&A and we'll have, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, so now I'll stop sharing I'll, and I'll open it up and we can start by uh, the different presenters of the, the YouTube videos, um, the, the different folks on the Kernza team um, to introduce themselves. So I guess Tessa, you can start out. Um, having me. Um, as Chuck said, I work for the Land Institute, and the Land Institute has been breeding Kernza um, grain for about 20 years, um, and we are also working to steward the Kernza market and, and bring the Kernza grain um, to commercial success. So we were really excited to work with the University of Minnesota, Forever Green Initiative, Moses, and all of the partners that made this possible to put together a video just kind of telling a little bit about the history. And that video also is largely a conversation between Carmen Fernholz, who's one of the first and most prolific uh, Kernza growers and, and uh, involved parties and Don Weiss, who was one of the really influential um, people who got Kernza going at the University of Minnesota. So thanks so much for having me and look forward to learning about everything that everyone has going on. Okay, keep rolling with introductions here. My name is Colin Curitan. I work as a supply chain development specialist with the University of Minnesota's Forever Green Initiative. Uh, as part of the commercialization team, I work on um, siting of new production acreages and uh, supply chain development, variety releases, and seed supply for the University of Minnesota's uh, Kearns of Seed, including the first um, Kearns variety released, and then Clearwater. And I'll jump right in after Colin because we're uh, we're a team. We're the commercialization team. Uh, and my work is focused on the market development, so understanding what industry, what entrepreneurs, what Greater Minnesota uh, wants and, and needs around Kernza and bringing that to market.
Um, it's all next. Um, my name is Jessica Connect. I'm at the University of Minnesota. I am a soil scientist and a environmental scientist, and I am really interested in. Um, I'm, I've been working with Kernza for a few years, and I'm really interested in studying the environmental benefits and the ecosystem services. And I'm I'm really interested to learn from all of you that of what the needs that you see, what things would you like to see measured in environmental um, quality questions that you have on your farms. So thanks a lot for um, being with us today. And then Jake. Uh -oh. Go ahead, Jake. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jake Youngers from the University of Minnesota, uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. I've been doing research on Kernza since about 2014, mostly agronomic research and some research to measure the environmental impacts of this new system, um, mostly as it pertains to water quality, uh, and looking forward to hearing from all of you about your thoughts and perceptions of Kernza and questions about how we can improve the profitability of this new crop. Hi, I'm Brad Hines. I'm uh, also with the University of Minnesota. I'm an animal scientist. So I work with uh, grazing and grazing dairy cattle production systems and also work with grazing Kernza where we've been uh, grazing Kernza for the last three to four years at our West Central Research Center in Morris, Minnesota, where I'm located. All right, and now we can uh, go to the main chunk of time, which is uh, Carmen Fernholtz and Luke Peterson at uh, A-Frame Farm in, in Western Minnesota. So I'll, sh I'll go ahead and share your PowerPoint slide. Um, and then you can, or you can just introduce introduce yourselves first, and then I'll I'll share it so that folks can see your face. Uh, Luke Peterson, uh, work alongside Carmen at A Frame Farms, Madison, Minnesota. Uh, organic grain farmer and introducing livestock to the rotation. And I'm Carmen Fernholz. Uh, Luke does more than work alongside me; he does most of the work because I'm sort of handing off to him, and we're uh, really getting involved with the uh, with the Kernza project. So uh, I guess uh, with that, uh, we can tell you that we operate what about 500 acres, yep. and corn, soybeans, small grains, some specialty small grains, alfalfas, anything else. Uh, introducing pasture to the rotation, and yeah, All right, and we will be introducing. Uh, a cow calf herd into the operation. In fact, I just talked to the gentleman this morning and sometime in August, we're gonna be getting some beef cows into the operation. So that's a little background on where we're at. So uh, you want to uh, bring up the uh, PowerPoint then? Good. And Luke and I are just gonna uh, talk about these things and we'll uh, show some pictures behind as we're speaking. And uh, they said, yeah, there would be questions and uh, opportunities afterwards. So feel free to uh, put them in the chat and we will make sure we answer them. And I think what we'll try and do is uh, just sort of follow the, uh, the year's progress on, uh, on planting and working with, uh, with Kernza. And so uh, generally here in Minnesota, the best time to plant Kernza appears to be in that Labor Day period of time, uh, a few days before to a few days after Labor Day. Uh, and so uh, in the years that we've planted now, the last two years, that seems to have been working out uh, quite well, wouldn't you say, Luke? <laughs> yep. yep, last year we didn't get much growth. Um, this is a wet, uh, very wet year and kind of cool after we planted and didn't get much growth, but it didn't matter, this year it came through beautifully. Right. Sorry, so, could you uh, speak up a little bit? Yep, yep. I was just saying how <clears throat> last year we didn't get much growth and we were kind of concerned about it, but it still came through really nice this spring. Good. So 
So we're talking about the best time to plant it. And I think the farther south you go, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Tessa, but like in Kansas, I think they can plant it uh, well into September, if I'm not mistaken, because they have a longer fall season and it gives the currents a better chance to establish itself. But when we're looking at uh, Minnesota, that looks to be the best time. So uh, where would we uh, plant the Kernza loop then if we're gonna try and put it into our rotation? Well, what we've been doing is planting it after our small grain, uh, just so we can hit that window of getting it, it in early enough. Um, so we've been following it with barley and wheat. Um, this year, um, I intentionally planted flax in front of the Kernza just because I was a little nervous about uh, disease issues with Kernza following another small grain. Um, so mainly after a small grain. Right, uh, and I know in the past two years we've planted after a small grain. In fact, the first year when we planted in 18, we did plant after wheat and appeared not to have any issues, but uh, that, can, that can change over time. We know that for a fact, but uh, the best time appears to be right uh, right after a small grain. And, and that does po pose a challenge for us here in Minnesota if we want to incorporate it into uh, a conventional system that has more or less a corn soybean operation. And so uh, we have to figure out if in fact we can get by planting it later, but for the time being, it looks like that seems to be the best uh, time to plant. So if we're gonna plant then, how do we go about doing seed bed preparation, do you think, Luke? Uh, all we've done in the past two years is we just worked the soil with the field cultivator. Um, well, actually broadcast manure, and then we worked it with field cultivator, and then the same day we came in and planted. And I think the last two years we've been lucky, and we hit a rain shortly after that. And we've had good luck with that. Right. Uh, and we know there's, there's a lot of work being done on fertility. How much fertilizer... Uh, in our case, uh, it's organic, so how much fertilizer do we put on? How much hog manure? Uh, I think the first year be, uh, behind wheat, we put on about uh, 2,000 gallons of liquid hog manure, which would have had uh, about a 40 to 45 pounds of N per 1,000 gallons. And that appears to uh, have been adequate. Um, our concern was that if we put on uh, too much nitrogen, we could get lodging and too much plant growth. And we know in small grains that can, that can be a challenge. Uh, after the first year, what we did is we, we just top dressed uh, about 1,500 gallons or so after we had harvested. And that looks to be, again, looking at the uh, fields this year, it looks to be coming along. So if you move the slides ahead one, uh, Chuck, uh, there you can see what the Kernza looked like in late March, early, probably mid-April. And that was the new seeding that we had planted in the fall of 19. And so you can see even by that time, it ha has a pretty good uh, growth going. And if you, uh, Look ahead then to the next slide. Uh, there's a little better picture of it. You can see it at that time of the year, it looks very thin. I, I wish I had taken a picture about a month after we had planted it, like uh, uh, October of 2018. And it was, it was a challenge to see the rows of Kernza and you thought this stuff isn't going to make it through the winter, but it, it is surprising what it can do. So looking at that, uh, we fuel cultivated it. What did we use to plant it with then, Luke? Um, we rented a drill from the NRCS office in town just because they had, a, they had the spirator in there just to make sure that the seed was continuously falling, falling through into the tubes and into the opening disc. But um, with the new seed variety, I'm not so sure we would have to do that anymore. Um, and I suppose it's a good idea anyway, but the the last stuff we planted did flow really nice. Right, because it's got better than 50% already polis, right? Yeah, yep. Right. And it was just a regular no, uh, Great Plains drill um, with a coulter tart on the front. 
And uh, the roll spacing, I think we were at seven and a half. Am I right? Yeah, seven and a half. Right, so seven and a half. I know the first planting that we did in 2018, we uh, we did seven and a half then too because we used the same yeah. same drill. That's exactly right. And we have purchased a new uh, no-till uh, John Deere drill that we're going to use this year, and that's at seven and a half inch spacing, and it's got a grass seeder on it. So we think we should be uh, good to go with that equipment as well. But that what you're looking at would be the seven and a half inch yep. spacing, and so that's that's where it's at come mid-April. So if you move ahead, uh, Chuck, uh, I don't know if you can see that one really well, but that's the um, that was the field that was in its second year. In other words, this is the spring of 2020 of the field that we planted in 2018. And this picture was taken sometime in early to mid-May. And so you can see that uh, there is a lot of, lot of growth there already. And uh, if you look at, uh, and check out Brad Hines' uh, uh, video, you'll see that uh, this type of growth would provide a significant amount of spring forage for grazing. And I, because I was amazed at how how much uh, growth there was on that field. I mean, it was. It's hard to say what the tonnage was, but it was significant. But that's what it would look like uh, in mid-May. And then, um, if you move ahead, there's just another longer view of the same field. You can see the growth. And our first year seeding, we had some uh, spots where we had missed uh, and there wasn't any currents of growing and that first year there was a significant amount of weeds that came in those spaces and so uh, if it's important to remember that you don't leave any blank spots in the field and when I say blank spots something wider than that seven and a half inch spacing because weeds will definitely come in and right now if I remember right, there really isn't an ex there's not an acceptable herbicide that can be used with Kernza. Uh, and obviously in an organic system, we don't have that option. What we have found, however, in the second year of that field, uh, there's virtually no weeds except for the Canada thistle. And uh, we know how, how tough the Canada thistle is. It'll come through cement cracks if it has to. But anyway, uh, other than the Canada thistle, there isn't virtually any, there's virtually no weeds in that field. I was just over there and walked through those blank spots. And um, now it's filled in with smaller terms of that they see in the south and there isn't any weeds in it at all. Right, you mentioned uh, filling in those. That's exact, exactly what happened. Some of the, some of the kerns that did shatter, uh, re-sprouted and filled in those spaces. Not all of it survived but a significant en enough amount that I think it, it was the major reason for suppressing the weeds. Yeah. Right. So moving on then, uh, as we got to, uh, I'm, when, do you remember when it started heading out? It was cultivating time. And so that would have been June, wouldn't have it? Yeah. Probably mid June, mm -hmm. mid to late June. Yeah. That's when it really started heading out. And talk about, the first time you walked through there when you saw the heading, what did it look like? It's kind of a, it's kind of, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it was pretty uneven. Um, kind of all over the place. Um, took a little while for everything to catch up and then pretty soon the field kind of leveled off and it all became the same height. Right, I, and I remember myself too, the first time I walked out there because I was still having visions of last year's field of how everything was just nice and uniform size and walked out there this year and everything was, <clears throat> it looked thin. So it was short, uh, small heads and uh, what, two weeks later, the field had pretty much just transformed into uh, a really good looking field. And so if you look uh, to the next slide, uh, there, I don't know if you can tell it, but that's the pollination or flowering stage of the Kernza. If you see those little yellow uh, things dangling off of the uh, seed heads, 
that's the pollination. It's, it's not a whole lot different than any other small grain in the pollinating stage. And uh, uh, Jake Younger has told us that we should keep track of that pollination date because we, we're, we're starting to collect data on how many de growing degree days or growing degree units will be necessary to get from that stage to when it's ready to uh, harvest. And it's critical uh, because uh, as many of us know, Kernza has, has, is e easily shatters. And it shatters because the, the, the seed head ripens from the top down. And by the time the bottom of that seed head is ripe, the top seeds are beginning to shatter. And sometimes those seed heads can be eight to 10, up to 12 inches in length and so you've got a long ways to ripen and so knowing when that uh, growing degree units ha uh, has accumulated for harvest uh, is going to be I think a critical thing in the future. We've got a couple of pictures here if you want to uh, buzz through a couple of them. Uh, Chuck yeah here's another one just showing uh, the heads itself and the next one there you can see a little closer the uh, flowering of the seed head itself. And moving ahead, there, uh, yeah, just another one. I w what I've been doing is just periodically going out and shooting some pictures just to keep everybody uh, connected on the update that's happening in the fields. Again, trying to collect data, trying to get as much information as we can about the, about the characteristics, the unique characteristics of Kernza. And I think this might be a good, good time. We sort of stepped over it at the beginning, but I think it's a good time to talk about Kernza not being wheat. And you had some good comments about that yesterday, Luke. Do you remember what you said? Um, yeah, just to not focus on the idea that we're trying to compete with um, conventional. Sorry, Luke, can you start over again? You're, it's cutting out quite a bit when you talk. I, I'm not quite sure why. But. Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah, uh, we were just talking yesterday about how the conversation shouldn't be around um, how Kernza should compete with uh, modern day wheat. Um, it's not wheat um, and Kernza is its own thing. And um, yeah, just basically that we're not trying to compete with modern wheat and um, that Kernza is gonna be its own product. Exactly, and I, and I just wanna emphasize that a little bit more because uh, we know that the, uh, the food products for sure that can come out of Kernza are, are, are a little more unique. And so yes, we wanna really develop it, not as a substitute for wheat, but as another crop in the system. And I, I just wanna make sure that we sort of keep that in mind on into the future. Uh, carrying on then to the next, uh, there you get a good picture again of the uh, of the pollination period of time. When was that? Like three weeks ago? Yeah, that was. I wrote it down. I, I've got it written down so I wouldn't forget. But it's about three weeks ago. Yes. Uh, the one thing we are finding uh, is that with the drier, warmer summer, it looks like the Kernza is maturing a little bit quicker, and I suppose that would be directly attributed to the uh, greater and quicker accumulation of the growing degree units. Yeah. Go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, there, uh, there you get a pretty good idea of the Kerns of field. Uh, if you go back to the other one, I think that's a video. You can, uh, you can see we sort of panned over the field a little bit. And this was taken about two weeks ago, but it was taken at sunset. So uh, it really isn't quite that yellow yet or, or close to ripeness, but you get a pretty good idea of the field. Go ahead. Yeah. Should we answer some of these questions that are popping up? You said what kind of uh, products are being made out of it, I just see. Maybe we can touch on that a little bit. I think it's good uh, to make crackers out of. Um, uh, it makes excellent beer. Um, what else do they make out of it? Uh, some we'll, we'll show them uh, some of the tasty bars that they make out yeah, of it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they're special crackers and stuff. 
Uh, yeah, you can end that, Joe. So do you want us to answer some of these questions or should we, I thought we were gonna probably leave them till the end and then, okay. and then Chuck can go through them with us and make sure we get them. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Yeah, because okay. some, of, some of them you're planning on getting to, so we'll just we'll, okay. we'll keep going along with what you have planned for now. Good. Okay, you can move on to the next slide then if you would. And there's, this is a picture of, the first picture you just saw there was of, of the first year seeding, the one that was planted last, last year. And this is the second, and this is the one that was planted in, in 2018. And this is 2018, yeah, and I just panned over uh, a little bit uh, just to give you an idea of the uh, countryside that we're growing this wheat in. It's a little bit rolly and uh, uh, very conducive to small grain production. So uh, we know that it's, it's a, good, uh, a good area to grow the Kernza. And just a little for in that video, you could see some light spots where there wasn't much Kernza growing. And we had a significant amount of water that sat in the field um, the first year, the first spring. And um, it seems you, to come can, Sorry, can you lean forward again? Oh yeah, sorry. I was just talking about the, the patches that were in the video that were kind of thin. Um, we had a, a lot of rainfall the first spring and um, it seemed to do fine in the really wet areas of the field. Yes, it did. And I, part of it might have been that it was still in dormancy, but regardless, it seemed to recover. And looking at that same area this spring, it, it looked even better. So it, it obviously didn't have any long-term impacts on it. I wouldn't recommend putting it in a wet spot, but if you have a wet spring, it did fairly well. Which, which reminds me, uh, brings up another point. A few people have uh, you know, talked to me and say, I've got this marginal field that doesn't produce a whole lot of other things and I'd like to plant Kernza in there. Uh, I guess what I'd say is if you wouldn't feel comfortable planting a crop that you want to generate some good revenue in in that field, I wouldn't say I would say don't necessarily consider Kernza there either if you're looking for a cash crop because we're finding that out and even in that field that and this field that we're looking at here when you move from the north end of that field to the south end the uh, the lush kernza improves or the better the crop just improves as you go to the north end of that field or excuse me to the south end of that field and the south end is much better soil than the north end so it's it's proving to us that Kernza likes good fertile soil, just like any other crop. The thing I think we have to keep in mind is that we don't want to be too fertile because it's going to do the same thing as small grains. If it's too fertile, it's going to lodge. So I think you can move on then if you want to, uh, Chuck. <clears throat> and this is what that uh, second year field looked like after the first or right before the first harvest in the fall of 2019. And that's pretty much the color that we were looking at uh, when we were getting ready to harvest. Uh, we'll show a close up again, but if you notice the seed heads, many of them are in an arc shape at this stage of, the, of maturity. Now it isn't, uh, it isn't a foolproof indication of readiness for harvest but it's it's a strong indicator and so uh, we uh, we're really watching that closely and I think if you look at the next picture there you get an idea if you notice some of the heads are straight and some of the and this one obviously in front is curved and you see some in the background that are curved when a majority of them start really arcing we know it's ready but we also have to keep in mind that Things, things can change with this crop. It may not be the same way every year. But anyway, that's when we're getting close to harvest. And so harvesting, we were experimenting with a few ways last year. Do you want to talk a little bit about it, Luke? Um, it's just finding the balance on from, you know, right from the top down. So your top seeds will be um, ready to go and the bottom ones will be green. 
and uh, it's getting easier to take out of the hull. So that means that it's also can fall out of the hull easier in the field. Um, so there is a sweet spot um, in there. We have to keep a close eye on it. And like any other small grain, I'd say. And Good. once you learn, once you learn your crop and have spent some time in the field with it, um, it, it becomes obvious when it's time to take it. Right. And what, what we worked on last year is uh, three different types of harvest. And we'll have a couple of videos here coming up shortly, but the three types uh, we did was we windrowed the field that you've seen pictures of and then harvested with a, with a pickup head. And then the field at Edgerton, Minnesota, we used a stripper head and the field near Pi uh, Pipestone, we used a draper head. And so if you want to move forward, uh, Chuck, that's, that's the field as it was windrowed. And there's a couple of them. You can just shoot a, show a couple of them here. You can see what we went. One thing I might mention is when we did windrow it, and you can see how heavy those swats are, we thought, well, this is going to take three, four, five days to dry out. And we cut it at about knee high. So in other words, we had a, about a foot or, you know, 12 to 14, maybe in 16 inches of stubble. Uh, and we still had a quite a bit of uh, biomass in those swaths. But the thing that absolutely amazed us is that, and the reason it amazed us is that the, the next day, that field was ready to harvest. And what we were concerned about is when we were swathing it, the stems were still juicy green, but in a matter of 24 hours or 30 hours, those stems had dried down to where they were almost dry enough to crack and, and, and when you, they'd snap. And so we, we were really amazed and surprised and pleased that we could harvest it so quickly after windrowing it because it takes the weather issue out of it quite significantly. And you, uh, you swathed it, uh, Luke, so you know what, what it was yeah. like. Yeah, and when we swathed it, we swathed it fairly low to the ground, um, just so we didn't have the chance of getting the heavy rain and having it being pounded down into the stubble, making it hard to pick up. Um, but if you see how wide that swath is, there is a lot of material there um, to run through your combine. It, we probably would have waited another day if we could have, but there was a rain that was coming, so that's why we harvested it right away the next day. And we did get that rain, which ended up being uh, a significant rain. Um, but there is a lot of material to run through your combine, so keep that in mind. Good. Okay, uh, move ahead, Chuck. There again, just another picture of that. Turns out another picture of the swaths. And then this was the pickup head that we used uh, on, a, on a rotary combine. And if you want to show the next one, I think is the video. The next one would be the video. Yeah, uh, or is it the next one, I believe? Yeah, go ahead and click on that, run that video. And while you're running it, we can talk about how we adjust to the combine. Uh, this was a rotor combine, and I think Sorry, you had the... I just wanted to check and make sure, was the sound too loud to hear Carmen talking when I played the video? No. Uh, you can turn the sound down if you want. Okay. Because the sound isn't necessary. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead, let her roll. Good. But this is... This is... Uh, harvesting that we the one thing to keep in mind with all of that crop residue and adjusting the fan lower rather than higher gives you a challenge of a lot of of uh, crop residue going through the return elevator and having a tendency to plug up that that elevator so be careful about that and then uh, run that rotor as fast as you can handle it and as tight as it'll take it. And uh, the fan, of course, you wanna keep it low so that you aren't blowing this, this grain over the, over the back end of the combine. And I don't know, we adjusted the sieves, top one fairly wide open, the bottom one pretty tight shut, Luke? Yep, yep, when we got that. So the straw would float and then the grain would bounce. Yeah, 
you can take the next, uh, you can move to the next video if you want, Chuck. We adjusted the rotor. We had it set as tight as we could. Right, and, and we knew how, we knew we had it as tight how? When you could hear it, yeah. <laughs> right. That means it was touching. So right. Just back, put off just a half a turn, put a morning when I Good. A loop yeah, we still so can't that's... hear you. Can you double check your mic? Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I was just explaining about how when we set the rotor on the combine, we actually turned the rotor and tightened it up until it actually touched and ticked inside. Um, so it was as tight as it could go. And then we just backed it off just a hair. So it went rub. So the combine was set as tight as it could be as far as the rotor was concerned. Good. Yeah. And uh, so it, it's, it's a lot like any harvesting any small grain, except it's such a small, light kernel that you really have to watch the amount of wind that you put on it. Uh, yeah, you can, you, there's two more videos there that you can go ahead and run right through and, and we'll just keep talking. Uh, the, the pickup head uh, really worked good. We had to obviously travel slow. And if, if you can move to the next video, Chuck, I would like you to do that because I want to give you an idea of basically how slow we really had to move with the combine. And this combine has pretty good capacity. So it can take a lot of straw, but we still had to move slow. But the reason I want to do that is because we'll have a video coming up shortly where we used the uh, stripper head and uh, the speed at which you can harvest is two or three times as fast. So uh, when this clears up a little, you'll get to see just how slow we had to actually move. It's a little bit jumpy here. It could be the, the internet is not doing it, but uh, whatever it is. Yeah, okay. We can move on then. So that was, that was windrowing and using a pickup head. The other, uh, the second way we called it was a stripper head. And uh, if you want to move ahead to the next slide, Chuck, uh, that's what it looked like in the tandem truck when we dumped it out of the combine. And so you can see it's, it's at least 50% free harvest. And by that we mean our, uh, most of the hulls now are coming off through the threshing mechanism or free threshing is I think what they call it. And that is really good to see because it's, it's gonna make it a better quality grain, easier to clean and process. And uh, like Luke alluded to earlier, it'll probably be easier to plant in the future and obviously easier to clean out. The other thing to note here is that by uh, swathing it, and we'll see the same thing by using the uh, stripper head, we uh, have very few of those little two and three inch long stems from the plant. And so that, that really makes a difference as well. It makes just that much better of a product in the hopper. So you go ahead and move to the next one. So this is a strip red and you can go through these and uh, fairly quickly Chuck until we get to the video. Stripper head sits on the front of the combine just like the pickup head, but uh, the video will show how it, how it actually happens when you get to the video. So uh, this is the fuel that we harvested down in Edgerton. And uh, if you can run this video and it works good, there you can see how fast that machine was moving through the field. He's traveling six to seven miles an hour and he has a 30 foot head on that combine. So in other words, he's taking a 30 foot swath with that combine. And all he's doing is taking the top, I'm gonna to say top six inches of that wheat uh, and running it through the combine. The rest of that uh, wheat stubble stays standing. I was walking across the field and that's why the camera was moving. So you go ahead and keep it moving if you want. And, uh, but I wanted to give you an idea of just how fast it, it can travel. And that's, that's pretty much the actual speed. I didn't, uh, didn't speed up the camera or anything. And uh, it was amazing 
how well it did. But what I would like you to do then after this video is done, Chuck, go right into the next video because that'll give us a picture of that header uh, if you can see it clearly enough and how, how it looks uh, when you can see it from the front and it's running. But I walked out in that field and uh, you, you, you just can't believe uh, what, it, what it can do. Uh, the other piece to keep in mind is that a lot of people are using the uh, stubble or the stock as forage because it's still green when you're harvesting it. And so if you can cut it, dry it and bale it or chop it, you've got good forage or you've got good straw. So here he's coming along now again. And if, if it, it, go ahead, let it move forward if it will. Because he comes right out and watch now. You can see how he's sort of kicking that straw ahead. That, that thing is spinning forward and knocking off the heads. And if you look closely, because he should come right towards us now, you can get a pretty good idea of what that header looks like. And he can lower it or raise it depending on where the heads of the, uh, of the grain are. The other nice thing about this is if you do have any weeds, a lot of the, a lot of the weed and a lot of the green stem is not going to even enter into the, into the grain hopper. Yep. So, but I just want to show that picture as well. And uh, Luke and I are working on it. We're not sure we're going to get it done this year, but we do have our eyes on a stripper head. And if we can make it happen before we harvest, we're going to definitely try it and experiment with it and try to generate some answers to our questions. And it, one thing I want to add about when you're harvesting, um, I just felt like you don't know what's coming off the back of the combine because the seed is so light. What we did is we just used an old pillowcase and I just held it right behind uh, where all the trash was coming out and we just sipped it through it and shook it so we could get all the seed to fall to the bottom and just gave us a good idea um, if anything was coming out the back. That's a great idea, Luke. You know, using that, that white sheet, that white pillowcase really told us if we were losing any grain. Yeah, because we don't know if it was shattering um, from, if you just look at the ground, you don't know if it's shattering from when you swathed it or when the pickup had hit it. Um, so this way you actually know if anything's coming out the back end of the combine. Right. And there again, you can see, uh, how clean you can get that grain. I mean, when you can have that percentage of uh, free, haul, uh, free harvest, uh, it, it really gets, it gets to be a great product and, it, and the, the buyers, the processors are gonna like it a lot more because it's gonna make their equipment work that much better because they have to be less dependent on the dehulling process, which they're starting to think may, if it has to be dehulled, uh, impact the shelf life of the grain as far as storage. So. All of these pieces fit together. And back to combining, had a few questions about what sieves we use, and we just kept the corn and soybean sieve in the combine, and that worked. It worked great. It worked fine. Great. I'm glad you remembered that. Yes, because we were wondering if we needed a special sieve, and come to find out, yeah, the corn soybean sieve worked just fine in our combines. Yep. Good. Great point. So that's what it looks like there. Then the third way that we harvested was what we called the draper head and if you move ahead chuck there's the draper head and that was a 30 foot head and uh what what became the challenge there is that you had to get down a little bit lower so that you were actually getting really adequately below that seed head and anytime you get below that seed head you stand the potential of cutting the green stem and that green stem having to go through the combine. As opposed to the stripper head, well, even though it's getting into the green stem area of the Kernza, it's still just stripping the head and not taking much, if any, of the green stem. So that was a, was a big difference. Uh, and it did, uh, I don't have a picture of what it looked like in the hopper, but it definitely, uh, 
what had a, a lot more uh, trash, I guess you would call it, or crop residue in the hopper. Not that the grain was any less quality, but the challenge would be greater in, in cleaning it and uh, making it ready for, uh, for use. But now I just, you can just run through the next few slides because we're about wrapped up here. Uh, Chuck, just run through and they just show a couple of more pictures, not a whole lot uh, to tell you uh, about it. But there again, uh, and that, that would have been the final thing. And uh, I don't know, uh, that, that's where we're at as far as our presentation, uh, Chuck. So if you want to uh, bring us back to uh, anybody else who wants to say anything or Q&A, uh, we're good. We can also play uh, Luke's um, YouTube videos as well. So I've got those loaded up here. Um, okay. So those have some good good stuff. So I'm just gonna share that real quick. Okay. Um, and I'll share the sound and uh, make sure that that you guys can hear me. Good. And and I'm hoping somebody can. Uh, uh, sort of go through the questions so that we can get as many of them answered as quickly as possible. Yep. So right here, I'm just showing this is just hard to explain. Hello. Yeah, hey, uh, just actually checking bins right now and thought this would be a great opportunity to show you what Kernza looks like. Um, this is crop from 2019, um, and uh, it's in the hall. And this lot will be going to Sprout Laboratories, and they're actually creating their own dehulling equipment and their own cleaning facility. Um, and they're going to market this grain as flour online. You can see it's much smaller than a wheat kernel um, and it has a hull on it that needs to be removed. This is the perennial intermediate wheat grass that we grow. Hey everybody. So I uh, took a break in the shop to come out and show off the Kernza field. Uh, it's green, it's lush. And um, I never planted this crop this year. This crop was planted not last fall, but the fall prior to that. Um, so it's been in the ground for a while and it'll be in the ground for another year after this fall. Um, Kearns is a, is a grain, it's a intermediate wheat grass. Um, if you, it's, there's, there's a lot of benefits. You can go from green to the field over there is black. Um, so what we want more of is this, control soil erosion, pull more carbon out of the atmosphere, um, and store it in the soil where it belongs, um, give the microbial life a chance to rebuild itself. Okay, so I moved some of the material away in the Kernza field, otherwise it looks like this. It's thick and um, covers the soil completely, protecting it from the sun and the rain and the cold. It's like a big thermal blanket holding in this, the uh, earth's heat to keep all the living things in it alive over winter and then keeping it cool in the summer when it gets so hot out. And these little guys, they're starting to come to the surface. And the perennial is great at allowing life to thrive because all of these little guys and all the microbes are busy building homes and roadways and channels and um, just doing their thing, you know. So by leaving them alone, we just allow them to live and then we get to benefit from all the good things they do for us. Like turning this into this, where we can grow our grains and bake a beautiful loaf of sourdough bread. Absolutely, you couldn't say any better than that. Uh, uh, and you were out there in January, am I right? Yeah. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I was curious. I 
brought a pickaxe and a shovel with. Um, I shoveled down through um, this last winter. It was knee high snow, and um, the, the might have the the snow was probably one reason that it was this this was the way that it was. But um, after I got through the snow and I I found probably eight to twelve inches of green grass kernza growing under the snow and it was green as lawn grass it was um i think it was still growing um anyway so i had my pickaxe with i was going to see how far it took me to hit um loose soil and in about three inches only um i was moving soil around almost like i was in that last video um the ground was uh in very good condition and there's a lot of material out there that I felt like was still still working. Um, but yeah. Good. Yeah, you know, I just, just wanted to point that out because I think it was significant. The other thing we wanted to talk about, and I'll, I'll be quick about it because I want to get to your questions. Uh, we in Minnesota who are growing and working with uh, Kearns are working with uh, Connie and Colin and a few key people uh, putting together a group of the growers and our, our eventual uh, plan is to bet, put together a marketing co-op for the Kernza because we know that it's not, not going to be easy to find the markets because a lot of uh, a lot of companies aren't even familiar with Kernza yet. And so if I'm going to grow it, I've got to have a market for it. And so we're meeting uh, as a group of growers twice a month, talking about marketing, how we can go about uh, growing it, harvesting it, storing it, and then accumulating it to take to the market. We also have uh, a, a steering committee of seven or eight people who are putting together uh, some of the, the uh, configuration, some of the work that needs to be done to form a co-op bylaws, constitution, whatever you want to call it. And we're moving ahead on that as well. We're looking for and seeking out a couple of grants to help us do that. But the point I'm making and the point I want you to keep in mind is that we know that a farmer wants to try new things, but a farmer doesn't want to try new things unless they have a market. And by putting together this co-op idea and forming this co-op, we want to make it easier for more farmers to uh, want to grow the currents because we know we'll find a market for it. And at the same time, what we want to do in that co-op is make certain that we put a value on the ecosystem services that that Kernza provides to our environment and to our social uh, infrastructure of this community. So all of these pieces we're trying to keep together when we're forming this co-op and hopefully by late uh, late fall into the winter when we have all the grain and storage, we will have some kind of an organized marketing system. It may not be completely finished yet, but a more organized marketing system for the Kernza. And uh, anybody on this call that's interested in finding out more about what we're doing here in Minnesota about the co-op, uh, by all means, feel free to get in touch with myself or a couple of people at the university on that whole concept. And I think that covers it, doesn't it, Luke? I think so. So uh, take it away, Chuck, whatever you want. Um, real quick, Carmen, would you yeah. mind if I put your email address in there for folks who want to get a hold of you about this marketing thing? Not at all. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't mind even, uh, no, let's leave it at email for now. And if they get in touch with me, I can always call them. Okay. Great. Yeah, so we had lots and lots of questions. Um, so one recent one, does it handle being cut or grazed early season? Uh, Brad, are you on? Yes. Can you respond to that question? Um, so the what question, does it, does it handle grazing early spring? Uh, you can graze that early spring, I think. Uh, and Jake can answer this as well. I think we do see some reduction and maybe it doesn't grow back as fast. We did a couple different grazing experience. We mob grazed it. So we 
put lots of animals on a small area, that maybe doesn't work quite as, as nice. Uh, fall grazing is probably better than spring grazing. Yeah, I'll just follow up with that. Um, uh, we actually did notice a slight difference in forage cutting versus the grazing in the spring. Like Brad said, we did see a, a little bit of a reduction in yields when we did a gr spring grazing. Um, but interestingly, we saw a little bit of an increase in grain yields when we did the forage cutting only after the first year. Um, subsequent years, we didn't see that benefit. So there's an indication that maybe in that first year, a spring cutting can actually boost yields, grain yields a little bit. Um, we noticed that from one site, we need to continue researching that, uh, which we plan to do in the future. Um, and then also as Brad said, that the fall cutting or grazing is a lot uh, easier logistically. There's just more time. Um, the window is bigger in the in the spring growers have to really be aware and conscious of the the growing point and if you graze too late you can graze off the seed head and then you won't have any grain yields in the spring or in the summer so that's a major concern and that really narrows down that window of of time so in the fall it's much more flexible graze any time any of that regrowth um, from really october until the snow flies and I, I think Luke and I will be over time in the next two or three years testing some of that stuff with our introduction of our herd here on the farm. Go ahead. Uh, another question. I don't think you touched on this, but do you have to fertilize every year? So I guess what, what's your fertilizer program for, for this? Uh, keep in mind that we're organic. And uh, so we have to source, uh, you know, alternative uh, fer fertilizers. Uh, what we're planning to do, and, I, and I'll start over again, what we did uh, before we planted the 2018 crop, uh, we actually knifed in 2,000 gallons of hog manure, worked the ground, planted the Kernza. After we harvested that field in 2019, we top dressed approximately 1,500 gallons of hog manure on top of there. and. What we also did is we, uh, we rotary cut and chopped all the remaining stubble and left it right on the field. So uh, we left, uh, left all the residue there. And uh, the crop, that, uh, the field that we planted in 2019, how much did you put on there ahead of uh, planting? In last year? Yes. 20,000. Okay, so in last year's field, he put on 1,000 gallons. And uh, I can't give you the P and K, uh, amounts, but uh, what we what we were considering is the fact that uh, generally the nitrogen was running about 40 to 45 gallon, uh, pounds per thousand gallons, and then considering roughly 70 percent availability for the first year, and so that's how we calculated it. Looking at the field uh, right now, it does not appear that we have over fertilized it. Uh, we're definitely planning on putting on another 1,500 to 2,000 gallons after harvest again this year. And uh, if the stand looks equally as well next year, we'll have to make a decision then whether to terminate it or to uh, keep it another year. And I'm thinking if we, if we keep it another year, we'll probably put some more uh, hog manure on it the same way. I really feel comfortable of putting it on at that time of the year because we have all of this growth taking place in that field. So we should get virtually no nitrogen leaching from uh, spreading that hog manure uh, late summer, early fall. Yeah. All right, another question was, there was, there was a few questions about um, the different uh, choices for for heads for harvesting. So uh, does does the choice of head affect the quality of grain in the tank? Does it affect the quality of the grain as far as seed? I, I think it just meant like, um, you know, after you've harvested it, uh, is there a, a difference from, from like a stripper head to the pickup head or something like that with the, like how much grain cleaning you might have to do or something like that? Um, there's a couple of things here that are variables and the the field that we used the uh, stripper head on and the field that we used the uh, windrow 
pickup head on were both the Min Minnesota Clearwater variety. This, the field where we used the uh, Draper head was the, uh, I think it was uh, C5, uh, and correct me, Jess, if I'm around here, or Jake, you might know too, it was a C5, which was, a, I'm not sure, as much free threshing, but the, uh, uh, the Draper had definitely had more uh, uh, clean out in the grain that was in the hopper, simply because we were cutting and taking through a lot more of the green stems and a lot more of the stem as we were harvesting. Now you may say, well, why wasn't that the case with the windrower? And the main reason was, is that the straw was so dry when we uh, combined in the windrow that most of that straw threshed out and went out the back of the combine. Whereas where it's green, it's a little heavier, uh, a little harder to, um, to separate. But, but the other big thing is that the moisture content of the draper head was going to be higher simply because you had more green material in the hopper. And so this can be a challenge. Uh, we also are finding that if you would have uh, some kind of a, a weed that uh, has a, a strong odor to it, that if, if that weed is fairly green yet, and you leave that in the grain without putting air on it almost immediately, the grain itself can take on the flavor and the odor of that weed. So all of these issues really come to light. And that's where the stripper head and the windrower really uh, uh, eliminate a lot of that issue or those issues that I've sort of pointed out. I don't know if I've made that clear enough. I was talking in circles maybe. Yeah, it's someone else's question, so I'm not too sure. <laughs> okay. um, another question was, how, how many years do, does it stay? Uh, how, how long do you keep a field at Kernza? And then um, how, does it, how does the yield change over time? And then how does it fit into uh, crop rotation? Jake, I'm going to have you uh, talk to that one, because you've done a lot of research along that line. You mind taking that? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so we often observe a decline in grain yields probably by the third or sometimes the fourth year and the yields will decline anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. Um, usually the yields are about 90 percent of our maximum in the first year so let's just say that the stand can produce a thousand pounds per acre. That first year we'll, we'll probably see something like 800 to a thousand pounds Second year often we'll see the, uh, the thousand pounds and then we see a decrease. And that decrease, it, the timing of it varies depending on how fertile the soil is. Uh, it depends on the initial row spacing and these are observations from the field. Uh, we still don't know exactly what's controlling the decline. So just anecdotally, we've noticed that uh, it has something, a little bit, something to do with the row spacing, how dense the field is, how fertile it is. Um, but that's probably our number one research goal right now is to figure out why that's happening and then how to prevent it. And um, I just want to share an anecdote too from the, the Land Institute in Kansas. They rarely see a yield decline. And it's kind of puzzling. Um, down there, there's a lot more stress on the crop. It's, there's not nearly as much precipitation. It's hotter. Soil is typically not as fertile. Uh, so that might have something to do with it. And like Lee Dahan just this morning was mentioned how he has stands that are um, well over five years old that are producing as much seed and grain as first year stands. Uh, so we got a lot to learn yet. Um, we're doing a lot of experiments with trying to disturb the field, either till cultivate uh, sh really shallow cultivation in between the rows to try to maintain those rows um, even looking at things like uh, scalping and like a really low mowing in the fall to, to provide some disturbance during that seed head initiation in the fall, even experimenting with fire, prescribed burning. So hopefully in the next few years, we um, will have a better prescription for how to maintain yields as they age. 
Uh, there was another question from earlier on about the spacing. So I think you said seven and a half inch. Um, and the question was, why, uh, why do it in rows? Why not do um, like broadcast single? Um, um, you want to go ahead, Carmen? I'll just speak a little, but you you fill in for sure. Uh, part of my rationale for uh, the rows is that I didn't have to buy any special equipment. Uh, I can use all the equipment that uh, we're using right now, and it was most convenient. Uh, it, it's just, for me, it was a lot like just planting any other small grain, but that's from a farmer's perspective. How about from a researcher's end? Yeah, some of those earlier studies where we did just broadcast seed it, um, we had pretty poor yields and spotty establishment. So it just seemed like um, sowing it either, you know, with a, a grain drill or a no-till seemed to produce more uniform stands. And then it, it did give us this idea that, well, maybe it is the spacing issue that's leading to that um, yield decline. So that's, yeah. There's a couple of different reasons we like to put it into rows. Um, also weed management. So organic growers who have tools to cultivate and want to go with a wider row spacing can cultivate in between rows for weed management. Um, and that's a, a really viable thing to do. So it's, we have um, uh, been experiments where we're testing currents of production and rows up to 24 and even 30 inches. Um, the results are not out yet on how those perform over the long term with the with the narrower rows. With the narrower rows, you'll definitely get a higher yields in the first year. That's we know. Um, but in the long term, now we're talking about three or four years over the life of the production. There is indication that maybe those wider rows can produce as much yield. So the we're still working on that. These are longer term studies, so it's hard to turn turn the data around and information get it out to you as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question was, does it make sense to underseed this with, say, red clover? We have a lot of legume intercropping trials going on right now. Um, most of them started with alfalfa, and um, then we started experimenting with intercropping lots of different forage legumes as well as native legumes. Illinois bundle flower and uh, Canada milk vetch. And so far we've learned that it really depends on where these are, are established. In some locations, some soil types, alfalfa works great as an intercrop and they both persist kind of equally um, year after year. However, in some soil types and environments, the alfalfa will dominate and take over the Kernza, while as in another environment, the Kernza will dominate. Uh, so now we're trying to figure out, well, what are the best environmental conditions for certain legumes? Red clover being one of them. And um, our partners over in Wisconsin prefer the red clover. And they've done a lot of research with different legumes. And red clover seems to be coming up as um, one of the, the best options. And uh, like down in Kansas, sainfoin might be the best option. We're doing some experiments uh, with the Land Institute on that. Um, but yeah, it's a great idea, and it, and it, it seems like it, it should work. We just got to hone in on the on the right species and the right configuration. How what's the right spacing for these two crops when they're um, in companion with each other? So that research is ongoing, and uh, hopefully we'll have some answers for you soon. All right, there are some questions in the chat about the economics of Kernza and some of the products. Um, and so I don't know, Connie, do you want to share a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, I will jump in and talk a little bit about the, um, the product and the product development that's underway. And then I'll hand it over to Colin. He did uh, put a number of, uh, put some numbers in the chat. So if you wanted to flip back just to see him written in there, you can, but he can talk in greater detail. Um, but on our end with the product development, um, what, we've, what we know is that Kernza can be used for a number of products. Uh, there's, uh, there's beer and there's bread and there's crackers, there's been pasta, there's been a range of applications for this grain. Um, 
And, but what we also know is that it does not behave like a, a typical wheat. It does not have that rising quality because of its um, gluten forming proteins uh, that are in it. So the applications so far have been mostly around uh, like pita breads or flat breads or scones or um, some of those types of breads. There is research happening at the university through our food science team to understand how they can improve the functionality of the grain. So they have been doing tempering studies um, and really trying to understand, you know, if they, they crack and remove that bran, how does that affect the way the, the grain, uh, uh, you know, then functions in some of those typical bread applications that's, that many of our consumers expect when they uh, bite into a, a piece of bread. Um, but I, what I'd like to also state is, you know, and Luke said this earlier in the presentation, is that we are uh, looking to create, you know, a grain that has, uh, that is differentiated from wheat as well. And so we are looking at flavor profiles. We're looking at, you know, what is the consumer, you know, reaction or uh, adaptation or, you know, interest in the flavor of this grain. Um, what we do, you know, when people taste it, it's, Got a kind of a nutty um, molasses type flavor, uh, especially when it's stored well. Uh, Carmen also mentioned that uh, you know it, it does pick up some of these off flavors if there's a bad weed in there, um, and so so that that's part of all of the work is understanding how flavors are affected and you know what then how the consumer reacts to that. Um, and then what we're seeing with industry is that they have a range of interest in this crop. They are very attracted to that eco those ecological services that we've been talking about, the water and uh, the water protection and the carbon sequestration. But um, what we always have to keep in mind is that if that consumer experience of tasting that grain is not a positive one, they might not come back to it. So we're continually uh, working on um, developing applications to improve, you know, uh, improve that consumer experience and uh, to make you know, eating kerns a, a positive experience. And so the last thing I'll just say is that we have a range of, of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurs and companies that are working with the grain. A big part of my work is getting samples into the hands of people who wanna work with that with the grain and so it's been a range of people from uh, brewers and distillers and bakers uh, to millers and um, you know through through that whole line of products so I'll, I'll hand it over to Colin if he wants to talk a little bit about the economics yeah sure thanks Connie just to add one thing to what what she said there and then to speak to the economics um, I mean we noticed that the the companies um, you know coming forward interested in Kernza um, you know, I'm personally a little biased. I think kerns tastes great. I cook with it often when I have access to it. Uh, but we, we definitely see that companies are very much interested in that uh, perennial grain crop story and those strong ecosystem services and the vision of the Land Institute and the Fro Green Initiative and everything that's attached to companies like Patagonia Provisions and their development of the regenerative organic standards. Um, so it's very much has a strong marketing uh, angle around that with companies that are really truly invested in that message. Okay, so to speak to the economics, I put some numbers in the chat thread, but review them quickly. We do have a crop enterprise budget uh, as well as an integrated supply chain model um, that uh, in incorporate what we know at this time about the costs and profitability of currents of production um, and supply chains. Um, the crop enterprise budget uh, suggests that uh, average first year costs, at least production here in the upper Midwest, is around $375 per acre uh, in the first year. We see those production costs drop by about a third, this being a perennial, you're not buying seed, you're not out there cultivating in the second and third year. Uh, so those, price, those costs can drop to about $250 per acre uh, in years two and three. So an average cost per year across say a three year uh, life uh, life cycle would be about $350 uh, per acre uh, per year. Um, the supply chain model uh, integrates a lot of assumptions about uh, acreage, yield, clean out rates, different production systems. Um, so one thing uh, you'll notice about the profitability of Kernza very much depends on your production system. Are you growing organically or non-organically? Uh, importantly, are you growing um, 
single use or dual use. So we're strongly promoting Kernza early on uh, for, you know, agronomically, but also economically as a dual use crop for grain and forage. Uh, a lot, this, this crop puts up a lot of biomass every year. Carmen spoke to this. Uh, I think uh, between two and three tons of straw per acre per year. And that straw is roughly uh, equal or slightly higher quality than wheat straw. Uh, and as Brad mentioned, it is possible to either graze or take a, a spring or fall hay cutting. The timing and the cost on the hay cutting, hay cuttings are uh, uh, timing wise tricky enough that at this time, unless you're really ex experienced doing that, we might just recommend you take the straw. But if you're taking three tons of straw per acre off of a field that costs $300 a year to, to produce, uh, and you're getting about $100 an acre um, uh, in terms of uh, on straw value, you're covering your cost of production almost on the straw alone, or sometimes exceeding it. And then the, the grain on top of that would be gravy, and it's a premium grain product at that. Um, there are more risks going into a, a food grade market with the new differentiated grain crop. So that's why we strongly suggest the dual use. Um, we've seen, uh, I hesitate from giving anyone firm prices because the, the price discovery process is still underway, but we've seen people start from a baseline assumption of somewhere around a dollar per pound at the farm gate. We've also seen people sell at double or more that, especially if they are um, producing a uh, high quality organic product and uh, negotiating themselves fair price. Um, some people have suggested since this does go through a, a processing stage that a, perhaps a two tiered pricing system where you have a price at the farm gate and then a premium based on the final clean out would be a fair approach as is common with some other uh, uh, grain, grain products. And so anybody who wants to look at these numbers more, I'd be happy to connect with you one on one, uh, provide you the enterprise budget uh, and or the supply chain model. All right, I think that answers most of the questions there. Um, so Carmen and, and Luke, do you have uh, the plant, the actual plants to show with you? Yeah, yeah, we've got them here that he's going to show it. And while he's putting them together, you know, the, I get the question from farmers who are interested in say, so is there going to be a market for Kearns? Uh, should I think about in doing some investing in it? And uh, having worked closely with uh, the Land Institute and the University of Minnesota and, and other places like the University of Wisconsin, when I look at the amount of research that's going on and then realize that uh, these same institutions have just secured a $10 million grant to further the work of, uh, of Kernza, uh, and then uh, the whole concept of the Forever Green Initiative, which we won't go into here. Uh, to me, as a farmer, the future for Kernza, I think, is very positive. Uh, when you have people working full time just on working on market development, it tells me that they themselves feel that it is worth investing in. And so uh, I say this to farmers, uh, I think the future is is, is very positive for this. And I think uh, we have to you know, know that we wanna keep the production in balance with the market development, of course, but I think we're doing a good job of that, uh, even as I talk to the people who are working on the research. Uh, Luke's got some pictures here, or some, uh, show and, some show and tell here. Yeah, so not that I'm comparing the terms of with wheat, but just to give you like a visual on height, basically. This is, uh, I'm standing straight up, might be hard to see. Um, annual wheat, um, and this is the currents next to it. Um, this is last year's planting. It's, that was planted in 2019. It's, um, it's a little greener for some reason, and it wasn't as thick in the field as um, the one that's two years old, obviously. It's got a very long seed head on it, which is good to see. Um, and they're all ripening fairly close together. Like the bottom is turning brown and the top is got a little bit of green left on it. But um, yeah, that was what we planted last year. 
that's the size of two years ago. It's definitely taller. Um, it also has a really nice tall seat head on it. Um, I'd say they're both really close as far as how they're um, right to me. About the same stage. Um, yeah, and I, it was cool to pull out some annual wheat grass because uh, I came out of the ground and had a really shallow root system. And I couldn't even attempt to try to pull out the roots of the Kernza. Um, I couldn't get the roots out, whereas the annual uh, pulled out really easily. Um, I had to break the kerns off in order to get it out of the ground. So I thought that was pretty cool to go from the one wheat field to the next. Uh, another question um, that I had missed was there was a question about kernza usage for developing uh, habitat or wildlife habitat. Um, and I guess Luke and Jake have been researching that. So if you want to share about that a bit. Yeah, yeah. Jake and Luke have been working with uh, yeah with the DNR with Lac Parl DNR on that. Um, they've done some underseeding. I can't remember what they underseeded now, um, but maybe test a few different harvesting methods um, and see what might be best for for wildlife. Um, yeah, Jake, you got anything? Yeah, I think we're just scratching the surface of this question of. Um, how Kernza could be used for wildlife as habitat. And I think it has huge potential. Uh, you think about all the biomass that's left in the field, uh, all that uh, fall regrowth, that's cover that all different types of wildlife can use over the winter, specifically ground nesting songbirds uh, in the spring when they come back from migration um, and uh, nesting waterfowl and pheasants. So species of economic importance as well. And what really sets this system aside from traditional pasture or, hay or forage hayland is that it's not cut in April and May when um, a lot of birds are nesting. So there's that, that, you know, that's one of the reasons that forage lands aren't the ideal habitat, even though they're perennial, is because we go through with this disturbance um, at a critical time for a lot of these nesting songbirds. Well, for Kernza, it's not touched until uh, harvest, grain harvest, in late August, or sorry, late July, early August. Uh, so there's a lot of interest, there have been a lot of questions about it, but um, not much has happened in terms of research. We have this kind of preliminary unfunded study with the DNR. Um, we're looking at planting kerns in some food plots and really just documenting to see what the habitat looks like. And hopefully we can use those uh, initial data to write some proposals and get some launch some real experiments and projects to actually measure the wildlife use of these plots. So if anybody has any leads on who might be willing to fund that research, uh, please let me know. Uh, we'll have some preliminary data to work up a proposal soon. Yeah, I also wanted to mention that uh, kind of related to uh, wildlife habitat, I guess USDA launched a new conservation pilot program, the prairie pothole producers to plant perennial cover, uh, largely related to, I believe, uh, water quality and wildlife. And I've been discussing with them and so long as that acreage uh, was not harvested in the, the, the prime nesting season, um, those acres could be harvested. And so, you know, looking for policy supports to um, funding is being rolled out for, for pilot programs like this to support some of those ecosystem service goals, thinking about how those pilot programs could support currency production. That's, we haven't scratched the surface on that either. Um, I don't know of any kinds of producers taking advantage of that pilot, but something we could look to starting, uh, you know, next year. I was just going to mention about the wildlife too, as far as, um, which had, it, the stripper head seems like an obvious um, way to still harvest the crop and then uh, leave the residue for wildlife to uh, live in and then to hold snow in the winter time. And you guys had some observations of flushing pheasants from that field in Edgerton, right? When you harvested that, Carmen? I think, I think uh, Doug told me, yes, that, that they did have, uh, have some good, wildlife there and I can see when if you've got uh, a five-foot uh, uh, Kernza 
and you take with a stripper head and take a head off, you still got over four feet of, of stubble there. And it's a nice wide field. So the, the wildlife protection there is, is phenomenal. Uh, and I mean, there's so many things that start surfacing as far as the ecosystem services. And, and there again, the wildlife, the pollinators, the, the birds, uh, all of these, uh, it's, it, it's just phenomenal what, what the opportunities are. Um, I'm going to digress a second because we were talking about marketing, but uh, yeah. we just wanted to show you what Luke and I are going to have when we're all done here. We got each a growler of the bang group. <laughs> So you're welcome to come on over and share with us. And then um, we've got also these tasty Kearns of bars that are made at um, Birchwood Cafe in, uh, in Minneapolis. And they are what they always say, uh, a taste to die for or whatever it is. Yeah. And Hold them up are... high so I can take a picture for Tracy. <laughs> okay. Nice. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and then what's the third item here? Connie, can you say a little bit about this? Talk, gonna... talk a little about that, Connie. Yeah, so these are Kernza crackers developed by the Columbia County Bread and Granola Company. They're out of Pennsylvania. And they had, they, they've been working with Kernza for a while, um, getting original grain from the Land Institute, um, but had to discontinue production for a while because they couldn't get a consistent supply of, of the grain. Um, but then in the last six months, we were able to connect them with uh, Sprout Labs that's doing um, a food grade distribution of the grain and they have started up production again. And those crackers in that box, which you can order through their online, um, uh, order online through their company. Um, and we're hoping to get them, very nice, I'm gonna get a picture of that too. Um, uh, and we're hoping to get some distribution into uh, Minnesota on that as well. Um, but those are made from Minnesota Clearwater, which was grown on Luke and Carmen's farm. So really? you can eat kerns of crackers. And is that true? It's 100% kerns in this box? Um, it, has a, it's, it has wheat in it as well. Okay. So, um, but they are, that's a great question. They are working on 100% kerns of products. So they, they actually are known for their sprouted bread. And um, so they are in the process of developing a sprouted bread uh, of 100% or probably a, a slight ratio of, of wheat in it. Um, uh, and there's, they're seeing some nice results from it. It makes like a real kind of flat rye type bread that I got I, a big perk of my job is that I get to sample some of these things and give my opinion. <laughs> And so they, <laughs> they sent me a loaf a couple weeks ago, and, and it, was, it was fantastic. So I'm excited to see what, see what they develop. Is, is, is Beth Dooley doing some of this work, Connie? Yes. So Beth Dooley is a, is a culinary professional um, based in uh, Minneapolis, and she has done uh, a lot of recipe development and um, um, work around using the grain uh, in various applications. She'll be coming out with a cookbook. I think in the next month or so, um, uh, like a perennial cupboard or something along those lines, and um, where she has a number of Kernza recipes in there. But she has uh, provided feedback, you know, on applications for Kernza uh, through the through the last few years, and has really served as this nice guide as we continue to think about where and how we can apply Kernza into the marketplace. Yeah, Carmen and Luke, I think you already know this, but everyone else on the line, that beer you're drinking as well, I know for a fact was made with uh, your uh, Kernza harvested last year. So wow. you're, you're supplying <laughs> your own food. Oh, yeah. You guys, you got to get both of us on there. Then. <laughs> yes. Can you get one of those? Get that, Connie? Uh, oh, hang on. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Um, that, 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 that batch is called Suds. And um, it is actually made with 100% um, Minnesota product. So it's Minnesota barley, Minnesota hops, and Minnesota um, Kernza. So, uh, and, and Bang um, 
has distribution in probably seven or eight stores across the Twin Cities. Um, and they have it in stock now and it is quite good. So, um, uh, you know, look it up and, and see what you can find. There are other beers in distribution across the country. So you can, um, you, uh, there's Longwood, Longwit Ale and Long, uh, Long Root Ale and Long Root Wit that are, um, that come out of Patagonia provisions. They're not um, distributed in Minnesota, but they do have distribution across the country. So if you do a little Googling, you should be able to figure out, um, you know, where you can tap into that. And then if you live in Minnesota, I think there's a little bit of Imminent Brewing's Revival still on tap and they're in Northfield, um, which is a great story in itself. That's a community effort to really build awareness around Kernza. And they used Kernza as a, as a they, they had a brewing contest and they picked out the best brew from uh, that, that home brewers developed and then put it on tap. So, uh, Brewing and distilling is is um, is a place where we are seeing a lot of interest and a lot of immediate um, application because because most brewers know how to use grains and they're interested and excited about the new flavors and opportunities and then lastly consumers are driving a lot of this so they are asking their brewers and distillers and bakers um, hey you got anything with Kernza. And so um, <laughs> any of you out there, it makes a difference. I, I get those requests because you're asking for it. So keep it up. All right, well, thank you. We're gonna wrap up now. Um, let's see. Uh, Chuck, yep. uh, can, if people got questions that they didn't get answered uh, relating to the production things that we tried to cover, uh, they've got my email tell them to feel free to call us or email me and we will communicate with them for sure. Yeah, that I was just going to say for all of the, all of the YouTube videos um, that are on our YouTube channel that are part of this series, uh, there are, um, oh, something happened. I clicked on the wrong, sorry. Um, all of the contact information for the uh, speakers today and all those are on in those videos so if you watch those videos they'll be there um, and yeah let me just quick share this last uh, oops. Um, yeah so and Carmen is one of our organic specialists so um, our organic specialists are our farmers that answer questions from other farmers um, and so Carmen can answer questions about uh, all kinds of organic grain production and especially about Kernza as he is um, one of the, the early adopters of Kernza and one of the people who has the most experience in the country about Kernza. So um, feel free to call us at 888-90-MOSES um, or 607-6337 uh, um, or email specialist at mosesorganic.org. Um, so let me, I'm having trouble for some reason with this slideshow. Um, so yeah, our next field day is um, on August 1st and that's about medicinal herb production. So not sure if there's much uh, overlap with this crowd, but that's, uh, that's available too online. Um, and then we have a free Moses swag bag if for, uh, for someone who fills out our Kernza trial results field day survey. Um, your comments and ratings really help us shape future events and help us learn from, learn from our mistakes and, and help us guide our future programming. So we really pay close attention to that. So please take the time to fill out that um, that evaluation form and you might win some free Moses stuff. So uh, thank you very much again for, for participating. Thank you to Carmen, Luke, and all the other folks that uh, shared on the YouTube videos and today. Uh, and thank you for everyone who, who took the time out of their day to be here today. So I really appreciate that a lot. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. You bet, thank you everybody. We'll enjoy the beer for you.
<laughs> yeah, I think uh, you did make everyone quite jealous with that. But. Okay. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right. Bye.